Sega. You have been a naughty boy, uh, uh, company. What am I talking about? This. On Wednesday, you randomly announced that on December 6th, 2024, less than a month away at the time of recording this video, you will be delisting Sega Genesis and Mega Drive Classics and the Dreamcast Classics Bundle, which includes my beloved Crazy Taxi. Game over. And not just from Steam, no. You're taking Crazy Taxi and all the other mentioned games, 74 in total, away from all the platforms they currently exist on. Meaning, for the first time since its original console release on the Dreamcast, Crazy Taxi will be unavailable on any major platform except Android and iOS. And the less we say about this mess of a port, the better. Seriously, why is pause and drive gear the same button? We got this handy FAQ on Sega support all about the announcement, but it omitted what I'm sure is the number one question people have. <laughs> You've probably guessed by now that I'm a pretty big fan of Crazy Taxi, and this news is the reason for this video, because this isn't the usual kind of content we do on the channel. Although I'll definitely be doing more retro game focused stuff in future, because retro games are dank and cool! Does that hit you in the nostalgia? Of course, it doesn't take a scientist to understand the reason for Crazy Taxi's delisting. They announced a reboot slash remake of Crazy Taxi last year in the Power Surge trailer that revealed modern entries in not just the Crazy Taxi franchise, but Shinobi, Golden Axe, Jet Set Radio, and Streets of Rage. Pretty cool, right? Haha, <laughs> not so fast, eager McBeaver. Earlier this year, reports appeared online that the new Crazy Taxi would actually be two games, a remake of the original and a multiplayer live service game. While these leaks remain unconfirmed thus far, that is troubling news if you're a fan of games the way they used to be. I was sufficiently agitated by this news that I went to the Steam community forum for Crazy Taxi where I said this, I'm talking directly to you here Sega, the modern reboot slash sequel is reportedly to be a live service game, and then I link to the article that I just showed just now. My personal opinion, it's doomed to fail out of the gate. Crazy Taxi was played and loved by an older generation that grew up alongside the games industry in a time before live service was the norm. We've all lived through it, moved on to our PS3 or our Xbox 360 and experienced years of microtransactions, DLC, ads, subscriptions, paywalls, mandatory account signups and all the rest. We are tired of it. Inflation is at all-time highs, and every company's response is to further increase prices as if there's an infinite supply of money. The days of paying for your game and being able to just play it whenever you want are long dead. And that's exactly why retro games like Crazy Taxi and indie games are the titles seeing the most popularity right now, because they're just the games. Gaming is like TV or music. It's entertainment. Recreation. We don't like having to spend so much time on in-game chores and ridiculous progress bars we can pay to speed up that it takes time away from the other things we enjoy in life. Live service games have commodified what should be our relaxation time into basically another full-time job, and if you don't engage and do all these mindless tasks that will probably have some paywalled feature, you'll be at a disadvantage versus other players and have a different kind of crappy time where you're underpowered and always on the losing end. This is why I believe a live service crazy taxi will not only fail, it will leave a last stain on the legacy of a beloved franchise, because the younger generation who has grown up with live service being normal has no interest in Crazy Taxi to begin with. It's as lame to them as 60s music was to us 80s and 90s kids. Their parents love it, therefore it is lame. Come on Eric, let's try to battle your rooster with my donkey tron. Uh, no, that's okay man. This is the part you really need to internalize, Sega. You already have a built-in audience for Crazy Taxi, and that audience is roughly between 35 and 50 years old. We don't want a live service Crazy Taxi, and if you go ahead with it anyway, we will not buy it and we'll continue playing the OG. I get that you want to make money as a business, and I bet you'd make a lot more by making and selling good games. Oh, and bring back The Offspring and Bad Religion. This is your actual customer base giving feedback here. We know better than your out-of-touch CEO, and we will prove it if you push out this live service reboot. Instant note from this guy. And no, the post didn't really get much traction, but I'm not really surprised, because again, the game is old and considered uncool by the young gamers of the world, if they've even heard of it at all. The recent election campaigns had Vice Presidential hopeful Tim Wall starring in a mod that inserted him into the game as a replacement for cab driver Gus. This was blasted all over social media and gaming websites, and... nobody cared! Crazy Taxi is 25 years old. 
I won't go into its history here, that's not the point of this video, but I do recommend you check out this one from Button Mash, which goes into the history of Crazy Taxi from its beginning all the way up to today and is well worth a watch. So go check that out before we continue. Welcome back. So that's where Crazy Taxi is now, old and irrelevant. So why do I care that it's being delisted if nobody but old farts like me is even interested in it? Because even if it's not shifting thousands of copies or filled with a massive player base, it exists as a time capsule of sorts of the world at the turn of the century. It's a piece of history. My history and your history. Yes, I'm using the games as cultural touchstones argument that's constantly at the forefront of retro emulation discussion. Right as I was working on the script for this video, an article dropped on Game Radar revealing Virtua Fighter, another long dormant Sega franchise, is also being resurrected with a modern entry. Now we know what the and more is. Within this article were snippets of an interview that Sega's global transmedia lead Justin Scarpone, a former Disney of Japan executive, gave to Video Game Chronicle where he said, We have another Virtua Fighter being developed. The interesting thing about that is you have a generation of folks who remember those titles fondly from their childhood or young adulthood who are in their 40s or 50s, and then you have a younger generation that frankly really doesn't have any connectivity to that IP. So the challenge is, if we try to reinvent these IPs, how do we connect? Which platforms and how do we evolve the lure for these IPs that are lesser known, frankly speaking? And how do we connect with new generations? Shinobi is a case where we have both a game and a film. So will that resonate or not kind of depends on if we have gotten better as storytellers and if we can reach younger audiences while also reigniting the core fans. I wonder if Mr. Scarpone read my post on the Crazy Taxi Steam forum. Bro, you are so close to getting it. You want to reach younger audiences while reigniting core fans? Well, frankly speaking, don't delist the games that came before. Forget old diehards like me who have the game already, and consider how many other people might see advertising for a new crazy taxi and think, I remember that game. Then they load up their Steam or their Xbox or whatever and see that they can still buy it after all these years. So they download it and have some fun and nostalgia and suddenly they're even more hyped for a new entry. And the answer to how you get younger generations excited about anything from before their time is to get the people who remember it fondly excited first. And believe me, live service elements do not excite core fans. They turn us off altogether. I'll put a link in the description to this video from Just Say Steven that gives a much more detailed look at what live service games have done to the modern gaming landscape, and it's worth a watch if you really want to understand the sentiments of older gamers like me. Today's young gamers made their memories in Roblox, Fortnite, Minecraft, and games like that. They never lived in the world Crazy Taxi was born in, and you're right, they have no connection to it. Except one. Why do you think Star Wars, Aliens, Predator, Terminator, Star Trek, so many old TV and movie franchises have managed to stay so popular to this day, or return after decades to massive success? Because the people making these things found that their IPs were popular enough they could keep on making these things without taking the things they'd made before away, even if there had been long periods of years between entries. Younger gamers are going to come to this new thing that so many people they know and look up to, like YouTubers and Twitch streamers and the friend's cool older brother and the favourite uncle, who are all excited and talking about it, and they'll want to see it for themselves. Then, the ones that like it will likely want more and dive into the expanded universes and older content that exists within that franchise. A new fan is born! The same is absolutely true of video games. That's what I mean about cultural touchstones. The old fans remember not just the game, but the world of its time and connect over their shared memories. They can also share those stories with younger gamers in their online and real life spaces and end up finding the common ground that is so often lacking between members of different generations because their formative years happen decades apart in different eras. Books have been doing this for centuries. The Lord of the Rings was published almost 50 years before the Peter Jackson movies, and their arrival became the catalyst for the modern explosion of high fantasy settings in entertainment media, paving the way for countless other adaptations of fantasy works. Movies and TV have been doing it for decades now too. Star Trek launched in 1966, and despite multiple hiatuses over the years, it's kept on bouncing back and kept on picking up new fans. And the video game medium, which has been a mainstream part of everyday life for over 40 years now, is no different. Would Sonic the Hedgehog have been such a massive cash cow for Sega today if his humble beginnings on the Genesis 30 years ago weren't enjoyed by the parents of today's younger gamers? Imagine if you released Sonic Forces or Sonic Boom or any of the other questionable Sonic games today without that history. The franchise would have been dead on arrival. 
The goodwill of three decades of Sonic fans is what has allowed you to keep bringing him back despite these choices. You either die a hero, or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. What I'm trying to impress upon you here, Sega, is if you haven't already, you are in danger of becoming a villain. You are becoming like so many other video game publishers, locking up their toys because they think it'll harm sales of the next thing they're releasing. I think Terminator 2's release in 1991 showed conclusively that if you make a product that improves over the previous iteration technologically, or expands the story in an interesting way, its sales won't be hurt by the continued existence of its predecessor, and there's no question that that type of success wouldn't have the knock-on effect of driving up interest in sales of the entries that came before from franchise newcomers. Which brings us back to the question of why delist Crazy Taxi and all these other historic Sega games at all, and leaves us with the only conclusion that's logical, you only care about money, and see the games that you've made as consumer products and not as the cultural touchstones that they are. I was a Sega kid. The Mega Drive, Saturn and Dreamcast were the systems I played throughout my teens and early adult years. Crazy Taxi was a big part of that, and along with Sonic, the reason I switched to the GameCube after the Dreamcast's untimely end. I revered the company and the amazing games it made. As a teenager, I dreamed of working at Sega, and never until now would I have imagined you'd become like so many of your peers in the games industry. I got my first clue that Sega was turning to the dark side back in June when Vim's Lair, a long-standing repository of retro game ROMs and manuals, announced that among other companies, Nintendo of course, Sega had demanded the removal of their games. They had already delisted the original Genesis Sonic games on Steam and other platforms in the lead-up to Sonic Origins launch back in 2022, but they had in the past kind of ignored the emulation scene. Sega is now doing what Nintendo does. In fact, they've been doing stuff like this for years. I can remember when I grabbed Sonic Adventure DX on Steam, and all the Game Gear titles were missing. They were there in the GameCube version, and then a decade later they were added back as part of a paid DLC for Sonic Origins. I had always admired Sega for how open and relaxed it was with the Sonic IP. Unlike nasty, mean Nintendo, they didn't shut down fan games and mods. In fact, they actively embraced and encouraged them, which culminated in the 2017 release of Sonic Mania, a complete return to form for the franchise after a rocky decade for the Blue Blur that single-handedly reignited core fans while engaging newcomers too. Are the pieces coming together, Sega? It's the fans that keep franchises alive and healthy. Releasing a new Crazy Taxi with unpopular and unwanted live service elements in it while simultaneously taking away access to the original is, frankly speaking, probably not going to end the way you hope. Even if you bundle it in with the new remake, the current Steam version has completely different music and voices than the beloved original, due of course to the usual music licensing rights twaddle, and people on Steam have supplied the resources to mod it back in. Looking at you as well, Sonic Origins. So the different crappy music version you'd most likely be bundling in with the new one isn't even a selling point for OG players, we're just gonna mod or emulate the old one anyway. Steam godfather Gabe Newell once said, Piracy is almost always a service problem and not a pricing problem. If the product is good, word will spread, hype will remain, sales will happen, whether the originals are available or not. So seriously, why remove them at all? As a lifelong fan, I am disappointed in you, Sega. No matter the reason or justification for doing this, it's a crappy move and I hope you'll reconsider, although I'm not holding my breath. Frankly speaking, I think the best move you could make to drum up hype for the new Crazy Taxi is to make the original free to play. If you delist it, it's not making you money anyway. So I'll end this video by saying while I'm thankful to Sega for the memories, I'm more thankful for the retro emulation community. Crazy Taxi is in your hands now. See ya! Game over.